Ed Bernstein Show. Now, here's Ed. There are some really great things going on in state. And oftentimes, we don't hear about it. Now, we have an office, a Nevada state treasurer in, in Nevada, and he's with me today, uh, Zach Conine. And, you know, you're doing some great things, and, you know, and I've told you this before. Most people don't really know what the treasurer's office is doing or how well we're, we're doing in the treasurer's office. So let me, let me ask you generally, what is the job of, this, of the state treasurer? Sure. Well, thanks for having me on and yeah. again, and, and thanks for the opportunity to talk about uh, what I think the best job in the state is, um, but not a lot of people know about it. So the treasurer is one of the six constitutional officers, right? The governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, secretary mm -hmm. of state, controller, and treasurer. And the controller and the treasurer are the two financial jobs, right? The controller is the state's chief accountant, and I'm the state's chief investor. And so at its core, that's what we're focused on. So uh, the difference being you would be raising the money and the controller would be spending it? Uh, more, we're <laughs> raising it, dollars come out through our office and the controller's office together, and then the controller is putting together the reports at the end of the year to tell folks how we did. So, okay, now in raising it, okay, for instance, um, the state now, you know, I, I, I guess, you know, you raise money and you invest it, and a lot of it, explain the whole bond rating aspect to, to our viewers. For sure. So there are times where the state borrows money to pay for things. And when we borrow money to pay for things, we go out and we sell bonds, right? And it works similarly to when someone goes and gets a mortgage for their home or goes and borrows money to buy a car, right? They are agreeing to make mm -hmm. a payment over a period of time. In exchange for that, they get the money up front to buy the asset, to buy the home, to buy the car. In the state, it's the same way. So when we sell bonds, we're taking money from 20 years of payments and bringing it into the present, right? I always say that bonds are like a time machine for money. Just like when you go get a car or when you go buy a house, you have a credit score. And the higher your credit score is, the more you can borrow, but also the less interest you pay in order to borrow that money. And it's the same way with the state. So since I've been treasurer, we've had two credit rating upgrades, which is basically independent organizations like S&P Global 500 or Moody's or Fitch, looking at all the finances for the state and the way we do things and saying, what is the likelihood that the state will be able to make its obligations? And because our finances are in such great shape, we've had two credit rating upgrades over the last couple of years, which means that taxpayers pay less for the state to build things like schools and roads and bridges uh, and sewer treatment plants. Now, a lot, not a lot of people come to the sewer treatment plant grand openings, but if you want to be there, <laughs> we'll hold a spot for you. So, so in essence, um, you're getting, it's easier to get money, to raise it for the state, and you pay less for the money that you're getting. That's absolutely right. Right? And, and, and the financial markets obviously, you know, are happy with the job you're doing. Yeah, and I think that they've said over and over again, right, that they appreciate our strong financial management, they appreciate the strength of our industries and the diversification that Nevada has seen over the last couple of years, right? Both the expansion of the convention center, the work that's happened up north with things like Tesla and Redwood um, have been very effective to trying to paint the picture that Nevada is up and coming. And we've seen it, right? We've had a really strong recovery coming out of the recession. The state is in the best financial condition as a state, as an entity, that we've ever been in. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have a ton of work to make sure that Nevadans are in the best condition they've ever been in, but at least the state is very, very solvent. Well, that's great, because the state, is, I mean, look, we, we, we depend on the state to provide services, to build roads, to care, to maintain the roads. So it, it's good. I mean, it's it's it's, it's a win-win. Um, you also, you, your department runs something called unclaimed property. Yes. How does property become unclaimed? Absolutely. So unclaimed property is sort of the most fun government party trick I know about. Because usually, right, when the government shows up, it's not because they want to give people their money back. Uh, but in this case, we get a chance to. We've returned more than $210 million over the last five years in unclaimed property. Here's how it works. Let's say you get a paycheck that never makes its way to you and you don't cash it. Or you have an apartment that has a uh, deposit on it, right? Or you make a deposit for anything, a utility, you make an overpayment, whatever. Someone owes you money. And they send it to you, but you never get it. Eventually, they have to send that money to us, and we hold on to it for you forever. And so you can come and get it from us. 
And so each year we return you know, 50, 60 million dollars to Nevadans um, who have lost money along the way. And it comes in the strangest ways. I mean, it can come from, it can be your money, it can be a relative maybe who's passed away and, and therefore it has become yours. Um, and it's really easy to get, right? And we've spent a lot of time trying to make sure that Nevadans can get their money back quickly and easily. And when you say forever, I mean, you just- Forever. Like 30 years ago, you, you, you were still holding money that today from 30 years ago- That's that absolutely right. Wow. You're right. That's a state law? That, that is a state law. It? We hold it in perpetuity, right? So we have more than $1 billion of Nevada's money waiting for them to come and, and get do you, it. And do you, are you able to invest that money? We or do. You just have to we hold? do. So you yep. can get the interest on it while Correct. you're holding it. That's right. Yeah. So typically, um, I would think a lot of this has to do with people, like as you started to indicate, you know, uh, deposits on apartment comp mm -hmm. uh, buildings or, or uh, rooms, and and then you move away, and there's no forwarding address, right. and, and the money then. So the okay. So the check is outstanding from the bank. Right. Right. So is it the bank that then notifies the state, hey, this check's been outstanding for three it, years, it five years? Yeah. It depends on the type of property, right? Mm -hmm. So if it's um, let's say a business has given somebody a payroll check and they haven't cashed it, that would actually come in from the business. The business sends it to the state to hold on to. But let's say you have a bank account that you set up 10 years ago, maybe a, a lot of times we see you know, a grandparent set up a bank account for a child, put some money into it, and then the mm -hmm. child lost track of it, right? Or you had a couple of different uh, bank accounts and you just lose track of one, it happens. Eventually that bank, if they can't get a hold of you, sends the money to the state to hold on. Let's say you had a brokerage account, right? You had an E-Trade account um, from two decades ago with five shares of something in it. Mm -hmm. um, if you didn't touch that account, eventually it would turn over to the state. Um, we would liquidate that stock and the money would be yours, right? So one way or another, what unclaimed property really seeks to do is it gives Nevadans a one-stop shop for finding money that they've lost along the way. So instead of having to go and call that old employer or that old restaurant who maybe isn't in business anymore, instead of trying to figure out what bank bought the bank that mm -hmm. you used to bank at, um, you can just come to us and we'll give you your yeah. money back. So, I mean, this is really helpful. So if you've changed your address, you've changed your name, yeah. people right? yeah. get married, yeah. change yeah. your name. So I mean, these are all, you know, a hints of, hey, maybe there's some cash out there. And there's these companies that, um, that will, you know, because I, I, I get mail from them. Yeah, like, air, hey, air finders. Yeah, look, uh, I, look I'll, let us help you find your that's right. money. Right? That's right. But it's not necessary, is it? Well, you know, I think those companies are really, really helpful when there are dollars that aren't necessarily yours, but maybe a second uncle twice removed, right, right who that property is yours now because of uh, inheritance, right? right? Like that, that is a place where those companies can be helpful. But if the money is yours, if it's Ed Bernstein's money, you can go to that website, fill out the paperwork, uh, and in less than five minutes, you can have a check on the way. Wow, and what is the website? Uh, so the website is claimitnevada.org, all spelled out, claimitnevada.org, or they can just go to our website, which is nevadatreasurer.gov, and get there. Um, or if you look at social media, this is basically all I talk about on social media. Um, we find people are more excited with getting their money back than hearing about our bond rating. Um, so we spend a lot of time talking about it. But it's, it's a great program. And, and let me say, you know, we are, we are a couple of weeks away um, from the holiday, right? Mm -hmm. Christmas is coming up. Hanukkah is going on. If you are looking for a perfect gift, you can just give somebody back their unclaimed property. Search their name, print it out, put it in a nice box, hand it to them. I've started to do this at weddings, but I, I don't get invited to a lot of weddings anymore. I love it. I love it. Your office also runs um, something called the College Saving Plans of, of Nevada. I was a participant uh, when my kids were young, yeah. when it first started, yeah. I, think, I think the first year. And I remember we, it was like, is that the prepaid tuition? Yeah. yeah. yeah same thing, right? So I, we pre, I remember re, prepaying my my kids were, you know, maybe eight, nine years old at the time and prepaid the tuition. So it insured them. If everything went terrible in my life, at right. least my kids would be able to afford to go to a Nevada State College uh, somewhere. And then if they went out of, if you go out of state, you get a credit for them. How does it work? That's exactly right. So yeah. um, our college savings office helps Nevadans plan for, pay for, and save for college. And it all falls into the core mission of the Treasury, right, which is investing. Investing. Mm -hmm at its basis is taking a little bit of money off the table now to create a little bit more opportunity later. So we have Nevada prepaid tuition, defined benefit plan. You can pay for a couple of years of college and then get that benefit down the road. If the student goes to college in Nevada, UNR, UNLV, 
it'll be fully covered, right? Their tuition will be fully covered. Irrespective of what the cost of the tuition is at that time. That's exactly right. So right. it grows as tuition grows. And if they go out of state, they can use whatever that cost is at UNR or UNLV as a credit against out of state, right? Um, we also have our 529 programs. We have five amazing 529 partners. 529s are like 401ks for college. So if you save money in those accounts, if that money grows, if it earns interest, if the investments do well, mm -hmm. which historically over time they have, then you are able to not pay taxes on those investment returns if it's used for college. And we have one of the biggest college savings programs in the country. We have $38 billion under management here in Nevada. Now that doesn't mean that Nevadans are more prepared for college than anybody else in the country. What it means is that our programs are so good that people come from other states to invest here. Mm. We charge them for the privilege and we use that to pay for things like the Governor Gwynn Millennium Scholarship, which has been going on for 20 years. We use it to pay for College Kickstart, which gives $50 uh, in free tuition for every public school kindergartner in the state. Now, all of that, and there's a lot more, uh, is on our website for that, which is navigate.gov. There's so much good going I'm on in your you. office. We're and, having and, a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, we just get, get the message out to people. Yes. The, um, the, the college in Nevada, uh, UNL, UNLV and UNR, um, how does it compare to costs of other state uh, colleges? It's relatively inexpensive. So certainly if you are a Nevada resident and you're going to any of our fantastic Nevada system of higher education um, institutions, you've got a real opportunity to save a bunch of money and be in a better place, right? And we, we know that student debt is a massive issue facing both Nevadans and people around the country. And to that end, a couple of years ago, we created a position called the Student Loan Ombudsman. And that Student Loan Ombudsman works with borrowers both before they take out student loans and after they take out student loans. Because sometimes, you know, I do work for the government, but I know the government can be a little Byzantine, right? A little hard to, to figure out different ways um, to get student loans forgiven mm -hmm. or to figure out the right payment plan to be on. And so that team exists to make sure that Nevadans have a resource. And that was really important during the pandemic. You know, we did a lot of things during the pandemic, but one of the ones that was, was most important was helping folks navigate what student loans were going to be like, whether or not they were going to have to pay them back or they were going to be forgiven, whether or not they could apply for a different program, how to make sure that student loans, which should be a tool to achieve higher education and a tool to create more upside for someone's family, didn't actually become a burden holding them down. And, and that student loan program, because you hear about it oftentimes on uh, on national news mm -hmm. is, is a federal program, mm -hmm. right? So your ombudsman is kind of a, you know, somebody who can, a resource to help with the federal program. That's absolutely so, right. So what, what is exactly the status now of the student loan? I mean, for a while it was being forgiven, then it wasn't being forgiven, then a percentage was, then it was being paused, and what is the status? Uh, up in the air, I think is the yeah. best way to describe it, right? Uh, President Biden has said time and time again, and he's mm -hmm. right, that the crushing burden of student loans is effectively keeping a generation away from financial success, right? And in a lot of cases, what we've seen is that, uh, not in Nevada, but in other states, the cost of tuition has increased as the availability of student loans have increased, right? So the government tries to do uh, the right thing by lending folks money to go to higher education. That makes sense, assuming that the degree is, is useful at the end of it, right, and that they finish it. Um, but then institutions continue to raise the prices, and so you end up in massive amounts of student loan debt, maybe with a degree that isn't markable. And so when that happens, right, I think the president has identified, people have identified that there needs to be a solution there that isn't uh, effectively just lifetime poverty um, because of student loans, right? Yeah. Does all the success that you're having with your investment portfolio, does that um, assist the, the colleges at all? I mean, is, is there sure. state, I mean, money, it's all state, state money. money that goes, because allows for a, a greater amount of the budget to go into college? Is that, yeah, and, yeah. And, and let's talk about that, right? So yeah. one of the functions of our office, one of the, the core functions of our office, is all the cash that comes in and out of the state. So if you ever pay into the state, right, when you register your car, thanks for doing that. You could do it more often right, than yeah. once a year. That's a, that's a choice. Um, <laughs> uh, but when you register your car, when you start I'm, a business... I'm still trying to get money back from a car that I sold that I didn't replace with the same license plate. Oh, no, oh, no, 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 that's DMV. You're never going to okay. see that. The, um, so when money comes into the state, right. that comes to us. When right. money goes out of the state, that comes from us. In between the time we get it 
and the time we spend it, we invest it. Right. And so as of this morning, we manage about $10 billion of taxpayer mm -hmm. money in a series of very, very um, not risky, right, risk adverse assets. But because we're managing $10 billion, and because we're pretty good at it, we've been able to generate massive investment returns over the last couple of years. But we made more money in investment returns last year than any year in state history by a multiple. Now state that again. Okay. We've made, I want our viewers to really understand, because when things look so bleak, and, and, and you, you indicated, yeah. I mean, personally, Nevadans are you know, struggling like the rest mm -hmm. of the country. Yeah. But as a state, you know, we're really locking in some some security, some financial security. Yes, yeah, so we don't say this a lot in the in the fixed income bond universe, but we are crushing it in our investments. And our investment team is exceptional, and they spend a lot of time trying to find this opportunity for Nevadans. Now, what that means is that we're able to add hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Our team of five people, and that includes myself, so really four and a half mm -hmm. investment professionals, are able to add hundreds of millions of dollars to the state's budget every year. Now, that hundreds of millions of dollars hopefully, and this is a process that the governor and the legislature have to be involved in and, and make those decisions, but hopefully can go to fix some of the problems that we've had, right? To make those investments that we need to make in affordable housing, to make those investments that we need to make in security and safety, to make those investments that we need to make in mental health, right? All of those things get easier if we have more money. There is no problem that doesn't become slightly easier if we have money. Now, money's not always the only problem, mm -hmm. but it's always one of the problems, especially in a place like Nevada where we have a tax base that doesn't include income tax and other things. Um, and so our work in the Treasury is to make sure that we make as much money as humanly possible so that taxpayers don't have to pay more in order for us to expand and even just keep government services. So the better you're doing in your office, the least I have to worry, worry about paying more tax That's exactly in Nevada. Right. I, don't, I, don't, I mean, look, we, we don't have a state income tax. Part of that is because of the success of what you're doing. That, that's absolutely right, and I think our work will continue to be finding ways to make sure that Nevadans have more opportunity, and that's going to mean making smart investments. You used to be a, uh, an assemblyman before no, your legislature. No, no, it's actually my first, is it? My first government job. No, no. No, I, I, uh, I was doing, um, I was working in the private sector. We had a, a small business, a little consulting company. We had done some work in gaming. And then um, Senator Reid uh, actually asked my wife, um, said that I should run for treasurer, and, and here we are. But you have to work closely with the legislature. Very much so. Um, and you, I assume you have to work closely with the governor mm -hmm. in establishing and helping to work through the budget. Mm -hmm. right. So how does that work? I mean, um, where does it start? Does it start with the legislature, the governor, or with you on, hey, this is how much we have? Yeah, so the, the first step in that process is a group called the Economic Forum, um, which is a, a series of economists and, um, and forecasters who try to figure out about how much revenue is going to come into the state, right, from all the different categories, and gaming tax, mm -hmm. and sales tax, and us, and others. Um, and we provide inputs into that, into that process. Uh, and they come up with a number, right? The state is going to have $100 in revenue um, in the next year. Okay. okay. Then the governor uses that number to put together what's called the governor's recommended budget, um, which spends $95 of that $100. We always keep a $5 um, cushion in, in the planning. So he puts together a budget that says, that's what we're going to have. Now, the economic forum, of course, continues to adjust and increase every few months. And so that number could go up or down. But he puts a budget together uh, and his team, Governor's Finance Office, puts a budget together to that number. Mm -hmm. That's the budget that he introduces at or near the state of the state. And then that budget goes over to the legislature who has control of it from there. And so they pass a budget through a series of, of pay bills, right? One that pays employees, ones that, uh, one that builds state buildings and other capital improvement projects, et cetera. They pass those bills, just like any other law um, or any other bill, and then it goes over to the governor, and the governor could sign it or veto it, just like any other law. Um, and when he has signed or she has signed those five uh, bills, then we have a budget, and we exist within that budget for the next couple of years. Now, what we've seen is that our investment returns have been so much higher than even we thought we could get them to. And so now we find ourselves in a bit of a surplus um, because even though we're seeing some slight decreases, some slight slowdowns and things like sales tax, our investment returns are dwarfing um, those decreases. And so we're kind of keeping the, the, the level level. 
Well, what's a better environment for the state when interest rates are high or low for it's, investment it, purposes? Guys, that's a fascinating question. So yeah. um, we manage both the, the, the investment side, right, where we want interest rates to be higher because we are lending money to individuals right. and getting paid a higher interest rate. We also manage the debt side, where we want interest rates to be right. lower um, because we're borrowing money to do that. We invest a lot more money than we borrow, right? We are general, We are certainly net investors versus mm -hmm. net borrowers. And so higher interest rates are better from a state perspective on that front. They are almost worse for everyone else. And so from a government perspective, we're certainly happy to have the investment returns, but we'd love to have an interest rate environment where Nevadans are still able to reasonably purchase homes and vehicles to start businesses, to get lines of credit in order to expand businesses, right? Lower A lower interest rate environment broadly um, is better for capital expansion. Of course, that also means that a lower interest rate environment is much more likely to drive inflation, which is what the Federal Reserve has been focused on, right? They're trying right. to get inflation down, and the way to get inflation down is to effectively cool down the economy. The way you cool down the economy is by making money more expensive and raising interest rates. And when, and when the federal government comes in and, and gives you a state money for capitalization, like, like the Biden plan, you know, mm -hmm. Um, gave us highway funds and some mm -hmm. some other funds like the infrastructure the infra investment and jobs yeah, exactly bill, right? thank you law um, so does that is the state pay part of that or is that all mm -hmm. federal government money and then how if if you haven't budgeted for that how does that work then so uh, great question because that's one of the areas where Nevada's sort of every other year legislative process and budget process does slow us down a little bit and so. On most federal dollars, not all federal dollars, but most federal dollars, certainly in the infrastructure investments and jobs law, there's an expectation that the state is going to pay some piece of it and the federal government is going to pay a much larger piece of it. Not the case with each piece, and the investment and jobs law has hundreds of portions, just like ARPA had hundreds of portions, and they're all a little bit different, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so one of the tools that we've created in the state, because if you need to come up with a million dollars um, to open up $10 million from the federal government, and we're not in the middle of a budget process, it can be really difficult to find that money. And so we've created vehicles like the State Infrastructure Bank um, that I'm the chair of, and we have a great board that does a lot of work, and our team does a lot of great work. That infrastructure bank effectively exists to fill those gaps, to do those um, what we call but for projects, right? So there's a project in a rural um, community right now that we're looking at that's trying to build a fire station. And they've got 90% of the money, but they can't unlock that 90% of the money unless they are able to get a commitment from the state. And we're going to be able to use the bank to lean in on that project and get that work done, right? And sometimes, you know, when people think about when people think about the treasurer, and I know outside of myself and my wife, not a lot of people do, but when they do, I'd like them to think about the work that we're doing to try and make sure that projects like that happen, right? Because government is just a series of people trying to do their best. And what we've tried to do in my five years so far in office is to find ways that we can lean in and be a little helpful and try to make a thing just a little bit better. You know, when you come into a job like you have, like go back to you know your first month on the job. Um, how do you go about learning the job? I mean, yeah. it, it, to me, it, it seems like, you, you know, you, you weren't in government before, you were in, in private industry, mm -hmm. came from the business world mm -hmm. into government, and all of a sudden you got this multi-billion dollar portfolio that you have to manage. Yeah, I think like any other gig, the, the first step is to learn from people who know more than you do, mm -hmm. right? And so we spent the first 90 days or so with each employee of the state, hearing from them, what do they do, why do they do it, how do they do it, how long have they been doing it, what is the reason that they do it, do they do it because it's what they think is the right thing, do they do it because there's some statutory requirement mm -hmm. or some constitutional requirement, really trying to get the layout of the space. And then we did what we did in the private sector as, as consultants, right? We triaged, we looked for where are the areas where there is the most opportunity for the least mm -hmm. time or the least cost and we focused on those, right? So right up front, we made sure that the culture of the office, which had struggled for a little bit, um, was good. And that's really important to us, right? You know, none of the work that we do in the Treasury is because I'm some sort of financial genius. The work that we do in the Treasury is because we have an exceptional team of public servants who are choosing to spend their time there, right? The state doesn't pay people as much as everybody else does, right? So everybody there is making a choice. Um, to do good work and do good work at scale, um, and so we have to take care of them, right? And so we spend 
a lot of time on the people because if the people are working, the rest of the stuff works. You know, the state right now is about a 20% vacancy rate. One in, one in about five jobs statewide is open, wow. right? It's tough in the private sector to hire people. Um, it's tough in the public sector. It's probably harder in the public sector. One in five jobs is open. In the Treasury, we have a 3% vacancy rate. We're able to provide better service to Nevadans because we take care of our people. Um, you know, recently we have the uh, Fountain Blue opening up hotel, the Durango Hotel. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do these new hotels, and these are huge hotels, how does it impact what you do? Well, certainly we appreciate it from a revenue perspective, right? Mm -hmm. and, and anytime somebody wants to come into town and spend the sort of money that, that Mr. Sofer and, and his team is spending, that the Fertitas are spending on Durango, um, that is always appreciated, right? And so we see it in a couple of ways. We see it in the sales tax generated during the construction process, right? As you buy construction materials, it generates sales tax. Mm -hmm. um, we see it in the payroll taxes. They hire, you know, hundreds of new employees, give Nevadans an opportunity to find um, a great life. Like, that's always appreciated. Right. Um, and then we see it in gaming revenue, right? Now, what we'll see with that and with any other new property is there's usually two things that happen. There's usually a spike at the beginning in gaming revenue because people want to go and check it out. And then it levels off, right? And hopefully the level off space is higher than what the aggregate was um, before the property opened, as opposed to just sort of moving from one property to another. Um, before I did this, I was in gaming. I used to work at the Gold Nugget for a couple of years. We opened the Downtown Grand, and, and we saw, right, the sort of the excitement of new energy at a property, um, but also just how hard that business is, right? Yeah. Um, and those gaming properties and those gaming operators spend a lot of time and a lot of work trying to build what they build. Well, this is great. look, you're making this stuff really interesting. <laughs> so uh, hopefully our viewers, if you want more information, you can uh, go to the Nevada Treasurer's website. Uh, Zach Koenig, uh, hey, doing a great job. And, Thanks. And keep all this positive stuff going for our state. We're doing what we can, sir. Okay. Thanks so much for having me. Talk to you soon. My name is Mark Lasala, and I'm a real client of Ed Bernstein's. I was driving on the freeway, the truck cut me off, dropped this whole drive shaft, I had a piece fly through my windshield, went across my body, and across my face. I found Ed's office through word of mouth. They just said he's the best of the best. They put you at ease. They show you compassion. They have your back. I'm Ed Bernstein. You've heard a lot of promises made by lawyers on TV, but if you really want dignity, respect, and trust, call me. The call is free.